So you see, I'm Tanera, and I'm the Domestic and Sexual Violence Prevention Program Manager at the Arizona Department of Health Services. Um, a little bit about me, I was at the Oklahoma Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault before we moved here. Um, I was there uh, for two years and I was a training and technical assistance coordinator. So what I did was connect um, our direct service providers, um, advocates and whatnot, and um, invested stakeholders. I connected them to resources so they can better um, provide those direct services. So the coalition doesn't provide those direct resources. We provide funding, capacity support, and training opportunities and things like that. So um, Ken mentioned um, ACES DB, the Arizona Coalition. Um, amazing, amazing organization. So if you're interested in any aspects of domestic sexual violence prevention, intervention, volunteering, um, it's a great cause, great organization, and I would urge you to check it out if you are not familiar with it. Um, so, just got to put this up here. The mission of the Arizona Department of Health Services is to promote, protect, and improve the health and wellness of individuals and communities in Arizona. And uh, we want health and wellness for all Arizonans as our vision. So, so I'm just going to jump right in. And I'm going to read kind of verbatim because I think it's important. So, given the advancements of technology and technology-assisted victimization of domestic and sexual violence survivors, it will be vital that new prevention, intervention, and response strategies are incorporated with as many coordinated, intersectional, and multidisciplinary stakeholders in addition to traditional community and criminal justice responders. So that's kind of a loaded, uh, long-winded sentence, but um, it, I might, it, it might be spelled out a little uh, better for what exactly I'm wanting to do and the collaboration aspect. So, what would be the impact on the quality of life of victim survivors of domestic and sexual violence in smart cities with access to enhanced services? So kind of what we were already talking about, what are those enhanced services? What does it look like? And in order to have those enhanced services, everybody needs to be at the table, beginning from the prevention piece to the intervention to the response. And so how do we get all these key players together? And then when we do get together, what are we gonna do? So this leads us to a coordinated community response. Anybody ever heard of the coordinated community response in second? Yeah. <laughs> no? Cool. Okay, so we have it uh, defined here based on the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. A coordinated community response um, team joins multidisciplinary community partners to provide interagency coordinated responses to domestic and sexual violence. Pretty much like the title says, collaboration meets the needs of victim survivors. That's the first major important part. Collaboration, keyword, meets the needs of victim survivors and more effectively holds offenders accountable. So that's the second piece. Without holding account uh, offenders accountable, perpetration is gonna keep happening because they can get away with it, right? CCRs can achieve their goals through an emphasis on one or more of the following. Criminal justice system, victim services, prevention, and long-term long -term help for survivors. Now, I would probably move prevention up to the front because again, if we are not preventing something, we're just keeping the problem going and kicking the bucket down the road. So, responders and service providers need to respond to domestic and sexual violence as one coherent process. This is on any, within any community, whether it's a college campus, whether it's out in the broader community, whether that is, uh, you know, um, in a hospital, in anywhere where survivor, victim survivors are going, there needs to be a streamlined process for all who are trying to help and support a survivor. So the establishment of CCR teams and response protocols can ensure that victims receive consistent and comprehensive services and referrals. It also helps offenders, again, to be held accountable regardless of agencies involved. So main takeaway, collaboration is key, right? And in order for that coherent process to be streamlined, we have to collaborate and get out of silos. Also, silos is a buzzword in the field. 
Kim, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Silos? Okay. <laughs> I think though that what's important to know is that every single person agrees that we should not work in silos, yet every single person works in a silo. Exactly. Often because of the structures that we have. You exactly. Know? And so it's in, 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 in wanting to have this conversation with, with, with you guys and with Kim's office, let's get out of that lip service of working in silos. Kim's office is doing amazing, fantastic things in terms of sexual violence prevention and education. But there's also other responses and other pieces across the campus and across the networks of Arizona State University. So what's going on in downtown should probably be mirroring, you know, if the conditions are the same at the um, uh, West Campus, right? But it all is going to have to depend on what the community's needs are, populations, and the response that stakeholders are providing, essentially. So we're going to break it down a little more. So these are two sets. It's two sets of needs met by a community response team. So we're going to use victim and then we're going to use criminal justice. All right? I'm not going to read, read all of it, but the needs of sexual assault victims are, and I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack just a bit, because on here it does say sexual assault victim, but studies and research show that victims of intimate partner violence are more times than not also victims of sexual violence. Mm. So you can't really separate a victim of domestic violence or intimate partner violence from being a survivor of um, sexual violence, whether that's um, uh, rape or what, whatever, some type of sexual assault. It's all intersectional, unfortunately, on the good side and on the bad. So the needs of a sexual assault victim are a coordinated response, that cohesion, that cohesion, that's what's needed for their um, for, for, for moving, I don't want to say moving past, moving forward because you don't, but in their process of healing. Sensitive intervention, cultural competency. That is probably one of the most important pieces in my opinion, cultural competency. That doesn't just mean race or ethnicity or your religious background, although those are all things that are definitely important. But your cultural competency can also include your geographic region, so your rural areas. There's going to be differences in an urban setting and a rural setting, as are the services that are available in both settings. And your cultural uh, identity is still something that is not something that you can just take away and, and not wear, right? You're going to be influenced by your surroundings. So early emotional support and advocacy, um, all these things, follow-up care, counseling, counseling for family members, justice, closure. Now, these two things can kind of be elusive, and you don't always, survivors don't always get them. That's the reality. But that's where we all come in, and how do we make these things um, something that is to be expected and can be delivered on. Now, the goals of criminal justice system, very black and white, as you can see, right? Protection of the victim and the community. What does that mean? Protect it. Pr protection? Well, we'll have to dive deeper into what that means. Participation by the victim in the investigative and judicial process. What if the victim doesn't want to participate? That happens. If a victim, say, um, someone who has been sexually assaulted, some of the things that you might hear, especially in media and all these things, well, why didn't you do this? If it really happened, why didn't you call law enforcement? If it really happened, why didn't you go to the hospital? Why is there no rape kit? Blah, 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 blah. Well, let's backtrack. We know the story of, you know, backlog rape kits. It's a national epidemic, right? We know what the victims experience through victim blaming across the channels, right? So those are all things to take into consideration. Accessible, prompt, high quality forensic medical examinations. Well, it'd be great when you get them, if you got it, but if you don't want it, you don't have to get it. And if you don't want it, that does not mean that your case cannot be taken up because you didn't go and get a medical exam. And also, 
there's that backlog I talked about. Can you, can you tell us more? What do you mean by backlog? Can you tell us uh, more? Sure, yeah. So backlog of the rape kit. It's a national problem. So when a victim goes to a hospital after a sexual assault, she's examined typically if a victim had facility with her mm -hmm. and then um, and stay with her through the process. So a SANE nurse, a sexual assault nurse examiner, would do that forensic, forensic exam. And then it takes so many, it, it's, it's live specimens for so long. I think it's like there's a 90 day period that when it's collected, it has to be turned in for analysis and all that. And then it goes up through ME or you know all these different channels to uh, determine that an assault did happen. And it preserves the forensic evidence for prosecution. Now by the backlog, Depending on, I would say, publicity around it, around an assault, if it's a high profile assault, chances are that rape kit is going to go up and the results are going to be out. Now for just an everyday, this sounds so terrible, an everyday victim, that is usually not the case, more times than not. And that's what we're finding through different task forces and things like that, Oklahoma just started a rape kit task force to address this problem. And like I said, it's a national issue. So the courage that it takes a survivor to one, report, two, go get that exam at the, at the hospital, three, it's a super invasive procedure, super invasive. And so at conferences, at a couple conferences that I've been to, and one workshop, uh, really hit home to me and the exercise. So I'm gonna do it just because I said I always wanted to try it in the last couple of years. So I thought you don't know anybody, right? And like, hey, what's up going on? And tell them your name, blah, blah, blah. And then tell them the last most amazing sexual encounter that you've had and who you've had it with and how great it was. All the juicy details go. And in that, people were like, oh my God, they're laughing and talking, embarrassed, turning bright red, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. But they'll talk about it, they'll give their name, yada, yada, yada. But the second they said, all right, let's talk about the last time we got down and dirty and did the horrors on the tango. They're like, what? That shock and surprise is what it would imagine doing that and being a survivor of, of a sexual assault. You're having to disclose the most intimate details of a sexual encounter that was not consensual and maybe potentially extremely violent and you're having to tell this to a complete stranger who is you're already in an intimidating setting you've already been assaulted and then you're having to give these most graphic details and obviously they all want these details in sequential order and that's not how trauma works. You're not going to you're not going to be able to process what mm. this traumatic experience was and then articulate in a manner that is going to be believable, especially to people in agencies and power. So that's what I mean by the backlog. So as you can see, the criminal justice system wants things like this in black and white. They want evidence, they want all of these things, and they want it in order. And again, like I said, trauma doesn't happen like that. So here are some considerations and some things to get us going and figuring out some solutions, particularly on the ASU campus, because we can use this as a testing ground because y'all are innovative, right? <laughs> so what have victims identified as needs or unmet needs? Are services accessible for individuals with disabilities? Are they available to LGBTQ individuals? Because we know one size fits all approaches do not work. They won't work uh, across other areas. They definitely will not work in, uh, in relation to victimization and uh, survivors healing. Everybody heals at different, at their own pace. Are ethnic minorities groups well served? 
Probably not. Are services equally accessible for victims residing in urban and rural areas? I already mentioned some of that. Are the institutional and community services available for victims living on college campuses, reservations, military installations? Is there a coordinated response with undocumented victims? And are services provided for victims with limited English proficiency? So all of these things are all things, are all communities on campus, right? And so what, opportun what amazing opportunity to have this kind of conversation and see what's going on on campus. And so to kind of sum it up before we start brainstorming some things, the principles of the most effective approach to domestic and sexual violence cases, bless you, trauma-informed, that's also a buzzword, being trauma-informed. Victims of domestic and sexual violence experience significant trauma which impacts their behavior. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Prevention and response strategies must be informed. I didn't bold it, but it should be. Must be, it's not a suggestion. Must be informed by an understanding of the neurobiological, emotional, and physical impacts of trauma on victims. So we need all stakeholders involved. Offender focused. Offenders need to be held accountable. It's that simple. Victim centered. We need to be meeting victims, victim survivors, where they are to address their individual needs. Prioritizing the needs and rights of victims whenever possible. Plain and simple. And we need to start by believing. Now, this phrase here, depending on what circle you're in, uh, can be a little triggery depending on, again, which community you're talking about. Law enforcement, they're not so fond of start by believing because it, 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 they say it leans to the law enforcement and prosecutors, that it uh, leads to bias. And I counter, no it doesn't. You are believing what a victim, an alleged victim, is, has said has happened to her. And then you're letting the process and investigation lead you to determine otherwise if in fact it didn't happen. But you're guided by the facts, you're guided by evidence, and you're guided by the investigation, essentially. But you have to get there first. And you have to, if somebody comes and discloses something like that to you, you're not gonna say, nope, sorry, I'm not gonna believe you. Well, I'm sure they do sometimes. But when something like that happens, you follow through based on the presumption that it could be true, right? That's what that means. And I think that this is so important because it's the same way that officers should approach any other crime, right? Exactly. Like if someone's car got stolen, you should also start by believing and tell you, you know, there's something that potentially makes you go down a different path in your investigation. Exactly. And for whatever reason with sexual violence, this seems to be um, a really hard thing to understand. Mm -hmm. So, And this is not the conversation of the context for you know feminist ideologies or you know all these things that you know people might throw in about being a social justice warrior. You know all this negative connotation to um, patriarchy, but it's all about patriarchy. Anywho, okay. So now using ASU as a paradigm, how can we do that? And. I put level one, nobody has designated this level as anything. <laughs> I did this this morning <laughs> by saying level one. So, this is Kim's program right here. Sexual and Relation Violence Prevention Program. This is what they do. But she that's works. not our app, sorry. Right, right, right. Okay, no, not, <laughs> sorry. Not their, app, not their app, but this is one of the safety feature apps that ASU employs. And are you guys familiar with the, is it Live or Live Safe? Live Safe, I'm assuming. Live, live Safe, safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is called Live Safe. <laughs> um, are you guys, have any of you guys used it, heard of it? Cool. All right, well, so if you hadn't and you didn't read it, it's a safety service in the palm of your hand. <laughs> Problem solved. 
Not really. We're going back. There we go. Okay, so this is what it does, essentially. It does not replace sign on one, and it's what Dr. Michael was talking about. In the palm of your hand, you can, you know, uh, let people know where you are, assaults happen, you're, you know, things like that. Send an emergency 911 text or call, activate safe walk, deactivate safe walk, request a ride from safety escort service, need motor assist, so all these great features. Super fantastic features of the safety app. And there are lots of them, lots of them, lots of them out there if you go on Google Play or uh, uh, Apple Store, but, and then, and so I'm gonna circle back around. And another thing that's come up, Wear Tech positions Phoenix as center of wearable tech industry. That was announced, what, I guess two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that, in the Phoenix hub. And so this is the first of its kind of applied research center, a partnership. That's the key word, partnership, collaboration, fun. The Partnership for Economic Innovation, the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering at ASU and industry and local economic organizations will support an entrepreneurial ecosystem to improve quality of life and human performance through the development of innovative wearable technologies. Level one, right? Level one, because like we said, what if somebody isn't wearing their wearable technology? How are they, what, what's, what's gonna be their, their safeguard if you're not wearing technology? I don't know, but it's a level one start. And I'm gonna finish with this slide, and then we're gonna talk about it. And so I wanna hear what you guys think. Jeff Goldner, president of Arizona Public Service says, the collaborative nature of an applied research center is what creates results. The idea is to bring resources from industry to move from a technology or research breakthrough to investment and then to manufacture. That benefits our state, Gittner said. It provides researchers with resources and support to develop technologies and solutions that the global, in my words, community and marketplace is demanding. And we're, going, and we're doing it right here in Phoenix. This is a prime opportunity a prime opportunity to have these conversations, especially if Phoenix is on the up and coming and, 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 and integrating the sciences, the technologies, the internet of things, all of this stuff is happening right here. So why not continue to focus on human-centered interactions in terms of violence, and, and, and holding people accountable who perpetrate that violence. And in this smart city world and all this whatnot, we can have all the technologies and the advancements that we want. Violence is still going to happen. Violence against women, violence against minorities, violence against community. There needs to be an appropriate prevention and response to that. And it needs to match where, the tw where we are going in the 21st century in terms of technology and combining all of this and maintaining that human-centered focus of enhancing the quality of life of victims and survivors wherever they may be. And the future says they're going to be in smart cities. So let's figure out how we can do it. And that's it.